meeting. And the uh, first speaker of this morning will be uh, Dennis Nestor from Vienna. He will talk about unramified chromophyton and Kupakuma papa embryo. Thank you very much for the introduction. And yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak. And it's, of course, a pleasure to speak of this in front of this audience, especially in light of the fact that uh, half of the names in my title are currently present in the audience. And so the, the title of the talk is uh, Unramify Grom Witten and Gapakum of Buffin Warns. And this is a talk about mathematical definitions. More, uh, more specifically, it's about how one can give a direct uh, algebra geometric uh, construction of Gapakum of Buffin Warns using uh, unramified ground width invariants, at least for a large class of geometries. And so, uh, so the, a brief plan of the, of the talk is as follows. So hopefully I'll start with a, with a gentle introduction to un unramified ground width and Kapakum Waffe invariants. And then I'll talk about a certain wall crossing phenomena in ground width theory. And using this wall crossing phenomena, we can actually prove that unramified ground width invariants and Gapakum of Waffe invariants are equal for fun and, I mean, in fun and primitive Kalabiawa cases. I'll explain what it means later. And then <coughs> the final part of the talk is about how this wall crossing fits into a bigger picture. I mean, some of you seeing the word uh, the word the wall crossing probably think about wall crossing in, in triangle categories in the context of Donaldson Thomas theory, but this is a completely different uh, phenomenon, and in fact, only recently it became possible to talk about this uh, this phenomenon as something general that holds in many different contexts. Well, for example, it holds in context of unramified ground within theory, then it holds also in quasi-map theory, holds in uh, landau ginzburg models, then uh, Donaldson-Thomas theory, Hurwitz theory, and and so on and so forth. So that we start with the with introduction, so I mean the best way to introduce unramified ground width invariants and Gapakum Waffe invariants is to talk about the standard ground width invariants. So for the most part of the talk, X will be just a smooth projective complex threefold. And uh, to, uh, uh, to to X you can associate uh, what's called the space of stable maps from nodal curves of genus G with and markings in the class beta. So in other words, this is just holomorphic maps from Riemann surfaces with possibly nodal singularities. And there are a bunch of n points, regular uh, smooth points, distinct smooth points. The stability, I mean, stability just refers uh, to the fact that the automorphisms of these maps are finite. And we identify all the automorphisms, I mean, all the maps by automorphisms. Then for a bunch of classes on X, we can define so-called ground width invariants. So we use, uh, we use these evaluation maps. So evaluation maps, they just send the a map F to the image of a marking PI. And then we pull back classes from X and integrate on the space MGN X beta. There are several ways of, diff of like making sense of this integration. You can use either algebraic geometry or symplectic geometry. I'll not talk about it in details, but uh, I'll just say that I will be always in the realm of algebraic geometry. And so, I mean, in, uh, in physics, this, this invariants, I mean, these are just correlators of a twisted A model, but algebraic geometers want to interpret these numbers as counts of curves of genus G in the class beta passing through a gamma i's. So gamma i's, you view them as some kind of submanifold, some loci in the target. And here's a picture, so you have this nice uh, nodal curve mapping to X, and then you count how many of them pass through this loci defined by gamma i's. But already from this picture, there is, you can see that there is a, a problem with this interpretation. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that in the space of stable maps, there will be contracted components, so there will be a, maps uh, from irreducible curves, such that one of the components of that curve is contracted to a point. So we call it contracted components. And then there will be so-called uh, multiple covers. So there will be maps from curves, such that uh, 
it's, I mean, it's maps to degree d, d to one on its image. So we call that multiple covers, and so what it means, the presence of this uh, kind of maps in the space of stable maps, geometrically, it will lead to overcounts and ground width invariants. So in other words, lower genus counts actually contribute to higher genus counts. So for example, if you look at this picture, well, it's clear that, I mean, we don't count four genus, uh, genus four curves, we count genus three curves because one of the genus is just being contracted to a point. And moreover, since we identify our maps by automorphisms, uh, the invariants that we get are actually rational numbers, but not integers. So what is the solution to the problem? The well, solution of Klebel three folds that came from the paper of Gopakumo Waffa. In the most basic terms, they gave us the following recipe to clean up our ground width invariants from these uh, multiple covers and contracted uh, components. So we do the following. Firstly, in the case of uh, Calabiao threefold, you don't have to put any insertions. So that's what this empty sign means. You just can count curves on the nose. You would put them, so we put this ground width invariance in the generating series. There are two parameters. One of them keeps track of, uh, of the degree. One, another one keeps track of the genus. And then we just do the following formal manipulation with the generating series. We express it in terms of the sign functions. Well, the leading, leading factor of the sign function is, is lambda. So this, you can express any any uh, formal generating series with even uh, powers of lambda in terms of the sign functions. And then you collect these coefficients in front over here, and uh, that you declare to be uh, gapakumov invariance. So this is indirect definition of gapakumov invariance in the sense that we use ground width invariance to define them. And well, more often, these invariants are referred to as BPS invariants, they count BPS states, but in this particular case, in the, in the context of ground witten theory and this formula, I'll refer to them as Gapakon Waffen invariants. Okay? Uh, well, if you've never seen this formula, it might seem a bit arbitrary. In fact, you can perfectly explain it from a mathematical point of view, but before doing that, I'll just say that you can do the same thing, not for Calabial threefolds, but for Fano threefolds as well. So, an example of Fano threefold is just a projective space. Uh, so you do the same, you just put the invariants in, the, in a generating series. In this case, you have to also do insertions. You could you need to insert gamma i's. In this case, it's simpler because, um, in fact, in the case of FANA, there are no multiple covers. There are only contracted components. So we don't have to sum over uh, q over the parameter that keeps track of the degree uh, because, because curves in, in different degrees don't uh, talk to each other in the case of fun. And so you have the same formula, so you put it in generating series and you then express it via the sign functions and that was proposed by Pandre Panda. And uh, you can actually verify easily that in a case if beta is not a multiple of another class and it pairs trivially with a canonical class of x, these two formulas uh, coincide. So let me talk about the properties of this invariance, I mean, and, and explain what the formula actually means. So firstly, these terms, sign, the sign functions, are actually responsible for contracted components, so their presence, in some sense, removes the contracted components from ground width invariance. And there are, um, there are Hodge integrals, I'll talk about uh, the Hodge integrals for moderate space of stable curves, and I'll talk about Hodge integrals a bit later as well. Uh, and then the summation over D, so let me just go back. You see we sum over D over here. So the summation over D uh, is a, oh, it takes care of multiple covers. And in fact, it's a, if expressed correctly, in, well, it's expressed in language of Donald Thomas here, this is a plethistic exponential. And this is just a shadow of the fact that if we upgrade our invariants to some vector spaces whose uh, like assigned dimension gives us the invariants, then uh, the, the symmetric powers of the vector spaces associated to BPS uh, invariance or Gopakumov invariance is uh, naturally isomorphic to uh, vector space that uh, associated to Donaldson and Thomas invariance or equivalent to Gromovic invariance. And then by works of symplectic geometers, well, there is a long sequence of works by Zinger, Yanel, Park, Don, Valpuski. I think the first one is from 2008 by Zinger, and the, the re most recent one is actually from 2021, and so what we know from their, from their works is that 
if we define a Gopakum buffer invariants like that, then they are integers and they satisfy a finiteness con, um, property, which means that they vanish for a fixed class beta, they vanish for a uh, high genus. So it took, uh, as you can see, it took mathematicians a very long time to prove this expected properties of Gopakum buffer invariants, and mainly because we don't have a, also a direct definition of them. And so altogether, this, this fact, in some sense, they solve all the geometric problems of gromm witten theory, so gopakumo waffer invariants are, in some sense, from a geometric point of view, they are just as close as we can get to actual honest curve counts. And, for example, this property of finiteness is particularly a nice one because, a priori, uh, gromm witten invariants, there are infinitely many of them for infinitely many uh, genera in a fixed class, and so, but this, the complexity of, the, of this infinite gromm witten variance is actually captured by only finitely many uh, gabakumo waffen variants. Oh. So, yeah, but as I said, we, we gave an indirect definition construction of this gabakumo waffen variance using gromm witten variance, and a direct construction is very much desired. By direct construction, I mean that we want to construct a, a space of something such that if we integrate over it, we get uh, Gopakumo uh, buffer invariants. So let me talk about what is, uh, how can we actually approach this problem. So the most popular approach is, in fact, my mathematical approach is, uh, is based on the works, on the work of the Gopakumo buffer themselves. And then there was the works of Hosono, uh, Saito Takashi, Katz, uh, and Kim Lee. And then uh, the final sequence in this I mean, the final work in this sequence was uh, Malik Toda's paper from 2016, and they proposed to define uh, uh, Gapakum Waffen invariants using the following geometry. So we take a space of one dimensional sheaves on X, so you can view them as kind of curves with the vector bundles on them. So we want to count curves with the vector bundles on them, and then we want to get rid of the contributions that come, that come from the deformations of vector bundles. So we want to retain only the information that is, uh, well, that is uh, information of the support of, of this uh, one-dimensional sheet. So, I mean, there is a Chow variety. The Chow variety is actually a, a space that uh, parameterizes, so this is Chow x. This is a space that parameterizes embedded curves, but for some technical reasons, we cannot define integrals directly on those space. And so instead, we use these one-dimensional sheaves with this projection to Chow. So it just sends a sheaf to its support. So if we have this f, we, it sends it to c. And then we use uh, this geometry. So you, we essentially use some kind of a virtual array um, filtration to get rid of the uh, contributions that come from the deformations of sheaves. And in this way, we can define, uh, hopefully, a Gopkin buff invariant. Well, the definition works for any Calabiao threefold. It's in agreement with the Gopakumo Waffe approach. Uh, uh, however, the problem with this definition is that, in fact, we don't know how to prove that this <coughs> the Maulik Todas invariants are equal to Gopakumo Waffe invariants. It can be verified in many uh, situations, mainly in the case of like local geometries. Uh, but then, in, beyond that, it's extremely difficult to compute uh, this invariant. If you didn't understand anything about this. Uh, Maulik Todo proposal doesn't matter because uh, that's the only time I mention it, and I will not talk about, uh, about this construction anymore. Uh, so let me talk about then another candidate uh, for, for Gopakumu Waffe invariants. Uh, and this is a, a proposal of Kim Crash and Oh. So, uh, well, it's called Unramified Grom Witten theory. And the, I mean, the idea is very simple. So as I said, I mean, the difference between gromm witten invariants and gopakumo waffe invariants is uh, contracted components and uh, multiple covers. So why not just remove uh, all of them? So multiple covers are difficult, but uh, contracted components are, in some sense, much more geometric because you can remove them by the following condition. You just require that your maps are unramified so their di uh, differential is non-zero at all points. Or, in other words, uh, your map is a submersion. So differential geometric uh, terms, this is just a submersion. So let's consider su just submersions from curves to our target. The difficult part is that you cannot just take a closure of such maps inside the space of stable maps. 
you will not be able to integrate over over this uh, over the space, and so we can we have to do something funky. So we have to, you, if you want to retain the condition of unramification, you have to actually allow your target uh, to become degenerate. And so a general unramified map will look like that. So it will be a map from an, uh, from a nodal curve to a target X with the bubbles attached to it. So by bubbles, I will mean uh, projective spaces of the same dimension. Uh, so the map is a submersion on all components but uh, the price that you pay for, for a space of such maps to be proper, compact, is that you have to introduce this, uh, these bubbles uh, on the target. If you know gram witten theory, so in order to compactify gram witten I mean the space of stable maps, you have to introduce bubbles in a, in a source. And so here we do the same, but on the target. So let me make it a bit more precise. So I'll call um, Fulton McPherson, the generation of eggs will be exactly X with these trees of projective spaces attached to it. I mean, you require that uh, uh, it's nodal well, in the sense that you don't allow uh, projective spaces to be attached, uh, more, uh, three or more projective spaces to be attached at the same point. Uh, but other than then, we consider all possible configurations of these projective spaces with trees of projective spaces attached to our fixed X. I mean, for the experts, this is what's called an iterated degeneration to a normal cone of a point. Divisors. Uh, but for the sake of uh, explanation, I mean, you can imagine that as an attachment. Uh, yeah. you, bl you need to blow up, and then you attach. But you blow up a point, so roughly speaking. So in the dimension one, if x was a, a curve, that, that's how it looks like on the nose. But in the high dimension, you're right, you have to blow up. Uh, so that's a Fulton McPherson degeneration. And just like in the Gron Witten theory, we can consider the space of unramified maps, not to X now, but to arbitrary Fulton McPherson degeneration. So arbitrary X with the arbitrary configuration of these trees of projective spaces. You require now, I mean, what you gain from that is that you can require that maps are actually unramified, so there are submersions everywhere. Uh, you have to identify, well, you also require that they have finitely many automorphisms, but now you consider automorphisms up to, not only from the, I mean, you can consider automorphisms on the source and on the target. So the, all these bubbles, they have scaling and, and translation, and you consider the bubbles up to scaling and translation, and you, ident you then identify maps from, uh, uh, from your curves to Fulton McPherson degenerations up to these automorphisms, both on the target and the source. And then you also require, I mean, just like in gron witten theory, you require it to be stable in the sense that there are only finitely many automorphisms. And in all, I mean, in all ways, the spaces of unramified maps uh, to this fulton McPherson degenerations is a, a very similar to um, spaces of stable maps, meaning that they're compact and you can integrate over them. In case of X is dimension one, this is actually something well known. This is just a compactified space of covers of a curve. Or in other words, it's a Hurwitz space. So Hurwitz space is just compactified space of covers of a, of a curve. And uh, so you might actually, rem I mean, you might say that, well, we actually complicated the problem. We removed, the, oh, we removed the contracted components, but we introduced the bubbles. In fact, for miraculous reasons, uh, uh, introducing bubbles is a much better approach because, for example, in the case of Hurwitz spaces, Hurwitz spaces are smooth and uh, irreducible. There are smooth uh, well, stacks, smooth delin mapper stacks. Unlike uh, spaces of stable maps, for, uh, I mean, spaces of stable maps to a curve actually have many irreducible components. They're very singular and so on and so forth. So in the case of uh, a curve, if X is of dimension one, that gives us a, a best possible compactification of maps from curves. So let me talk about the properties of this unramified gron witten variance. I mean, just like in the gron witten variance, yes. No, uh, this fault in McPherson generations, they can, they deform to each other. You can, uh, you can take an X and you can actually degenerate X to X with these bubbles. So there will be 
if you're referring to that. You're referring to the fact that the, the target is different. I mean, the target is, uh, is not fixed, and so there are many. One that, the, so the moduli space yeah. is defined, is it? Uh, well, I mean, that's unclear, but because it's very complicated. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it, it virtually it's smooth. I mean, there is a notion of a, it has a perfect abstraction theory, just like stable maps. You don't know, uh, you don't know if model space of stable maps are connected, smooth or reducible. I mean, they have very complicated deformation theory, but you know that they have a perfect abstraction theory, so you can view them from a perspective of derived algebraic geometry, you can view them as smooth, uh, uh, smooth uh, model spaces. The fact that whether they're connected or not, it's actually not important for many purposes. Yeah, so we can define uh, unramify gron witten variants just like in a usual gron witten situation. You just pull back classes and integrate them over this space of unramified maps. And there, uh, there are subtle differences between this unramify gron witten variants and gron witten variants. Uh, well, firstly, gron witten variants, you can package them in what's called the cohomological field theory. It's just a consequence of the fact that you can, well, they, there are, well, you have gluing maps and there are compatible with the invariants. In the case of unramified gron witten theory, you cannot, it's not a cohomological field theory in the, in the same way, well, because in order to glue maps, you have to glue photon McPherson generations as well. So, for example, just like Hurwitz theory, uh, uh, unramified gron witten theory in general is not a cohomological field theory. But it has a nice property because of unramification, you can always lift maps to photon McPherson generations actually to the projective projectivization of a tangent bundle. Why is that? Because, well, our, all of our maps are submersions, so the differential is not zero, so you know where a tangent uh, lines in your curve map to in a target. You have to make it a bit precise in a case when the, when the target has bubbles, but you can do that. And so in particular, you can view, well, you can lift uh, uh, maps to the projectivization of a tangent bundle, so projectivization of tangent bundle parameterizes points with a, uh, with a tangential directions at those points. So you can always lift maps from uh, photon person generations to uh, these projectivizations of tangent bundles. And in particular, you can view unramified gron witten theory as a theory that lives actually over five-dimensional complex manifold projective uh, projectivization of a tangent bundle. It's a very useful perspective. Uh, in fact, I mean, it will be crucial for something later. In particular, if you take cohomology of a projectivization of a tangent bundle, it has more classes, so there is a hyperplane class, uh, modular sum relations, so you can, you can insert more classes, so in some sense, unramified gron witten theory is richer than a, a usual gron witten theory. And what's, what's true is that if you actually pull back uh, uh, this hyperplane class, take a degree with respect to it, I mean, if you pull back a class, uh, I mean, using this lift of a map from a fault of a person generation to projectivization of a tangent bundle, uh, you pull back H take the degree of it, it will be equal to 2G minus 2, and so it recovers a genus, and in some sense, a genus parameter in the unramified gron witten theory becomes a degree parameter. I mean, this, this fact will actually, uh, these last three facts will be useful for computations. I don't know how to make sense of it in a, how to put it in some kind of a bigger framework. I mean, I know that uh, five, com five complex dimensions appear in uh, uh, some papers and some considerations. Uh, similar to, I mean, in which also Gopakumov uh, invariants appear, but I don't know if it's part of, uh, of that story. Okay, so that's uh, the properties of unramified gron witten invariants. Let me <coughs> go back to, uh, to uh, Gopakumov invariants. So as I said, I mean, when you, when you use unramified gron witten variants, you can only, at least in the, co in the form that I presented, you, we only remove contracted components. We didn't do anything for multiple covers. Uh, but, I mean, it's already good enough for some purposes. In particular, there is a conjecture. The conjecture is the following. So if X is a funnel, so like a projective space, for example, or Calabiao and the class is not, a, is not a multiple of another class, we call it a primitive class, then, in fact, unramified gron witten variants are equal to Gopakumov invariants. Or in other words, if we use Gopakumov invariants using the formula that I presented before, uh, well, this conjecture just states that if we, 
put a, a ground width invariance into a generating series like that, it's equal to a ramified ground width invariance up to this uh, sine function over here. Okay? And so, uh, I mean, the, uh, the main, one of the main theorems of the, of the talk is that this conjecture is true. And more interestingly, uh, in fact, this formula is a wall crossing formula. So this, uh, this guy over here is a wall crossing formula. And uh, unless you have any questions, I'll, I'll move to the second part of the talk about the wall crossing. So <laughs> where does the wall crossing come from? And what does it mean, actually? So I'll explain now, I'll explain how, how we prove this theorem. So I'll explain how we uh, show this, uh, this identity, in particular how we prove that unrefined ground width invariants are equal to Kapokamupov invariants using this uh, wall crossing technique. So where does the wall crossing come from? Uh, well, in fact, uh, ground width theory and unrefined ground width theory are, uh, there is something in between. There's, uh, there are theories that live in between them. So we can define intermediate theories that interpolate between uh, those two theories. And the way we do that, it's, uh, it's quite simple. I mean, it's not something super fancy. So we consider a map from nodal curves with the markings to arbitrary photon map person generation. And then to each point of the photon map person generation and each bubble of photon map person generation. So bubble. When I say bubble, it just, uh, let me go back. By bubbles, I'll always mean this projective, uh, projective space attached to X. So, so uh, to each, uh, each map from another curve to W, uh, we can ask, to each point in W and to each bubble in W, we can associate what I call weights. So it's just some integer values. Uh, I would denote them Wx and W projective space, uh, I mean, W bubble. And these weights, we, they measure, when well, in case of a point, they measure how far uh, a map is from being unramified over that point. And then in case of a bubble, in some sense, it measures how big the, the, uh, the bubble is over this, I mean, how big the curve is over that bubble. I will not fully define how you how this uh, this weights, but for example, if you have a map and it, there is a contracted component, then it's clear that uh, a weight should also account for. I mean, the weight should account for this contracted component. So, in particular, weight. Uh, so, if there is a contracted component, then contracted component will contribute two g minus two uh, to the weight of that point. And the same happens if you have a bubble and then there is a curve of genus g over that bubble. So, it will contribute two g minus two. To, uh, to the weight of that bubble. Okay, and then we define the following thing. So it's for every epsilon, uh, a positive uh, real value, we say that the map is uh, epsilon ramified if for all points in X, the, the weight of a, of a point is less or equal to one over epsilon. And for all bubbles of that uh, photon person generation, uh, the weight of the bubbles is greater than one over epsilon. So one over epsilon is, is uh, purely a convention, so you can, you, can, you can just put also epsilon. And so here is the definition of epsilon ramified map. So what, what's so nice about it, so in some sense, it's a, it's a middle ground, I mean, it's between, something in between unramified and usual stable maps. And as we vary epsilon, we go from stable maps to unramified maps. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that more more specifically. So firstly, let me define now a space of uh, this epsilon ramified map. So for each epsilon a real value, we define this space of uh, epsilon unramified maps. So this is just uh, well, maps that satisfy. So this is maps to all photon map person degeneration, degenerations, and then they satisfy the condition of uh, being epsilon unramified. And then, uh, well, we view this epsilon as a stability parameter. So each, ep each value of epsilon gives you a stability parameter, defines the stability of a map. And then uh, it partitions the half, half line into, into walls and chambers. Chambers are those uh, parts of the half line where the space, modular space of epsilon ramified maps is, uh, is actually 
here. Differential geometric terms. You can, in the case of a, in the case of a curve, is a branching divider. So you take a, you, you take the relative uh, relative cotangent complex, and then you push it forward. It's going to be some uh, uh, some complex, perfect complex on a target, supported in, uh, in on points, and uh, you use that uh, you, you use the thing to define this epsilon ramification. In high dimensions, it's a bit more complicated because the uh, relative cotangent complex is supported on the entire thing, so it's not going to be supported on points. Yeah, you, or I mean. Yeah. Forget about relative cotangent complex, just relative, uh, re relative, uh, relative cotangent bundle. I mean, you can use relative sheaf, uh, relative cotangent sheaf to define this identification. So, yeah, so this uh, epsilon, so, what was I saying? Uh, so you have this uh, modern spaces of epsilon ramified maps. And so there is, uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, half real line is partitioned in chambers and walls. So inside chambers, this uh, spaces are the same. And yes, you cross the wall, it's, Space suddenly changes, up, 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 like discontinuously. It's well, actually, walls just by definition of our weight. I mean, there are integers. Of course, uh, the walls will be just integers. But it's still useful to view this epsilon parameter as a continuous parameter. And so, what's so nice about this uh, epsilon uh, unramified maps is that for small epsilon, you get back uh, the space of stable maps. And for uh, uh, epsilon greater than one, you actually get a uh, space of uh, unramified uh, maps. So in particular, these uh, spaces of epsilon unramified maps provide an interpolation between spaces of stable maps and spaces of uh, unramified maps. I mean, it's easy to see. So if you use this definition of epsilon ramification, well, take epsilon very small. So if epsilon is very small, it says that ramification at all points can be arbitrarily large, but the weights of the bubbles, uh, I mean, they have to be infinitely big. And if you take epsilon very small uh, by compactness, I mean, the bubbles cannot appear then in your model space. And similarly, if we take now epsilon large, if epsilon is large, you allow any bubbles, but uh, because, I mean, that value becomes very small, and then, but you disallow all ramifications. In this way, you recover both uh, spaces of stable maps and uh, spaces of uh, unramified maps. Um, so here's a picture. So you have this um, two, two extremal behaviors. One of them is gron witten theory. Another one is unramified gron witten theory. And in between, you have this epsilon and ramified gron witten theory. And so gron witten theory is characterized by these contracted components over here. So you have this contracted components mapping to some points in your target. Unramified gron witten theory is characterized by this existence of these bubbles. And then you have epsilon ramified theory, which is a mixture of both. You have both bubbles and contracted components, but up to, up to some uh, weight, up to some degree. And now, as you chain, change epsilon, you go from one extreme, extreme situation to another extreme situation. So from one, uh, from unramified gron witten theory to uh, gron witten theory. And on the way, you pass through walls and chambers. Inside chambers, you have the same space of epsilon ramified spaces, uh, maps. And then as you pass the wall, it suddenly changes. And so what's so useful about this construction is that instead of now comparing gron witten theory to unramified gron witten theory, you actually can compare theories that are just uh, in adjacent chambers. And in a fancy language, when we have, so epsilon is a stability parameter, a stability condition, when we have a stability condition, the variation of a stability condition leads to ball crossing formulas. And we, so we do, we kind of ball cross at each wall, and then we put it all together to compare unramified gron witten theory to, uh, to usual gron witten theory. So we can prove a wall crossing formula using this uh, epsilon ramified maps. I mean, I mean the ideas of Chakan, Fantanin, Kim, and Zhao from the Poison maps actually are extremely crucial in the in the proof of the wall crossing formula. So uh, let me say firstly what this wall crossing formula means in the in a, in plain English. 
So wall crossing formulas will, will compare gram witten theory to unramified gram witten theory, and the, the difference between the two will be measured by Hodge integrals. So Hodge integrals are integrals on a space of stable maps, so stable curves. So Hodge integrals are integrals on a, on a modern space of stable curves, not maps. And you integrate psi classes and uh, lambda classes. Psi classes are classes associated to uh, line bundles given by cotangent uh, spaces at points, at marked points. Uh, while lambda classes are churn classes of a Hodge bundle. So Hodge bundle is just given by differential forms on curves. So the difference between gram witten theory and unramified gram witten theory is just Hodge integral. And though I mean, Hodge integrals naturally arise by localizations on projective spaces, for example, and essentially in this, uh, for the same reason they arise also in our considerations. But more specifically, in our, in our case, the Hodge integrals are in some sense invariants associated to parameter spaces of uh, ramifications. And uh, what's more, I mean, this wall crossing formula, it's universal. So this Hodge integral contribution, Hodge integral's contribution is universal and depends very little on x. So in, in some sense, for every x, gram witten theory and unramified gram witten theory are equal up to uh, terms that are, depend very little on the target. I mean, on, only via some simple topological data. So that's what this wall crossing formulas. Uh, yeah, I mean, should say there is no epsilon here. So as I said, epsilon is more like an auxiliary tool that we use in order to compare theories and adjacent chambers, and then we put all together to arrive at the wall crossing formula that compares extremal uh, values of epsilon. I'm not using quasi maps at all here. I'm saying that the ideas of uh, from quasi maps were useful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah when you change, when you vary epsilon, yeah, wall crossing, wall crossing terms are exactly Hodge integrals. It comes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying the matter a bit. I will, I will show what how Hodge integral looks like. Uh, so that's what it says in plain English. In, uh, in mathematical terms, uh, the wall crossing formula takes the following form. So you, it actually is true in all dimensions. It's also true for any kind of invariance. So you can also put descendant invariance, or actually you can put something else there. So, and the wall crossing formula says the following. So if we take descendant gram witten yeah, I mean, psi classes are just, uh, psi classes are classes associated to cotangent uh, spaces at the marked points. So if we take a descendant uh, gram witten invariance, we take then descendant and ramified gram witten invariance. The difference between the two is the following formula. So what does this formula say? So firstly, there is summation over here. We sum over ordered partitions of G and the number of markings. Then for every part of this ordered partition, we have a Hodge integral. Well, this Hodge integral is, in fact, I mean, it's a class in a, in a cohomology or projectivization of a tangent bundle with a uh, formal variable z attached to it. It's given by Hodge integrals. I will, on the next slide, I will actually show how it looks like. And then we substitute the variable z with a relative psi class. Uh, so there is a variable z over here. So it's kind of a, a rational function. And then we, we, when we plug it in into this, in, when we treat it as an insertion over here, we substitute z with a, with a relative psi class. And as you can see, there is a bar here. So invariants on the left are usual absolute invariants. They're associated to markings on a, on a source. But the invariants on the right are what I call relative invariants. So they're associated to markings on the target. There is a subtle distinction between markings on the source and markings on the target. And we have, you know, for this wall crossing formula, we have to do it. We have to do. We have to introduce the markings on the target in some sense. And so we treat this i, this i functions, and then uh, well, they're given by Hodge integrals, and then we treat them as insertions. So I mean, you don't need to understand this formula. Uh, I just want to show that, actually, I mean, it's a concrete formula that you can, you can work with this formula. So it's very, yeah, you can use this formula to prove things. So let's apply this form, wall crossing formula in dimension three. Uh, so uh, as you said, yeah, there is a tangent bundle. So the actual Hodge integral looks like that. So you take, uh, a Ho so this integral takes place on MG1 times uh, projective uh, projectization tangent bundle. 
Uh, so you take a uh, Hodge bundle times Z, you z view Z as a trivial line bundle of, uh, with a, of weight one, of C star weight one. You take tensor with a tangent bundle of X, and then here you have uh, Z minus H minus Psi one. H is a, well, as I said, relative hyperplane class in the projectilization of a tangent bundle. Z is just a formal variable, equivariant formal variable. And then after summing, over genus, so you have this Hodge integrals we sum over this genus, and we get the formula that looks like this. So this is this exactly the same sine function to the power to the following exponent. So the way to make sense, so this is a class in a, in a, in a cohomology of projectivization, projectivization, projectivization of a tangent bundle, and to make sense of this, uh, uh, of this expression, you, you just take log of this expression and then take an exponent of this expression. And now you, we plug it in, so you, if, you, if you recall, this is exactly the same sign functions that appeared in the comparison, I mean, the formula that compares Gopakumov invariance and uh, gromm witten invariance. So if we plug it in into, into the wall crossing formula, and then, I mean, I, I'm dropping lots of details. Essentially, you, it results in this, in this formula uh, uh, stated in the beginning of the, of the, of the talk that compares uh, Gopakumov invariance to uh, gromm witten invariance. In particular, so we show that unramified gromm witten invariance are also related to gromm witten invariance via the same formula, so it means that unramified gromm witten invariance are actually equal to Gopakumov invariance in the case when there are, I mean, in the case when the target is a Fano threefold or a Clavial threefold, and the class beta is not a multiple of any other class. And this exponent over here, it, uh, well, you kind of arises to, uh, due to Dilaton and divisor equations. So you have that exponent over there, and that exponent turns into this exponent by, uh, yeah, by Dilaton and uh, certain versions of Dilaton and divisor equations on the, on the unramified gromm side. Okay, so that's all about the Gopakumov invariance. Let me zoom out and uh, talk about this wall crossings more generally. Ah, there is also idea of a proof. Yeah, <laughs> so there is a. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me first brief, uh, briefly mention uh, how we prove that. So here we use epsilon. We, for each wall, essentially we construct uh, a master space. So a master space will contain, uh, contain uh, spaces of, of epsilon ramified maps in adjacent chambers of the wall. And essentially it looks like, I mean, it looks like almost like a projective bundle. So there is a C-star action. And if in a nice situation, the C-star action will kind of move one uh, one space to another, and the uh, resulting invariance will be equal. But as, as this star, as this star action move, moves one space to another, there are some other components that are picked up on the way. And these extra components will be exactly the uh, wall crossing components that appear in the wall crossing formula. So that's a rough explanation of what happens. So we use the master space technique to prove the wall crossing formula. Now let me talk. Let, uh, let me talk about uh, this wall crossings in, in general. So in fact, in dimension one is already something interesting. So firstly, in dimension one, and ramified gromm witten theory is just a Hurwitz theory, as I mentioned. So Hurwitz theory is in something much more concrete. I mean, it literally counts on the nose how many covers a curve has with a specific, a specified ramifications. It's expressible purely in terms of like topological data, the fundamental group of the curve or also the representation theory of symmetric groups. And so for uh, ramifications who are just partitions of degree, so for each ramification profile, for a collection of ramification profiles, we can define a Hurwitz number. So this is just, it counts how many curves of, how many covers of degree D with a specified ramification profile a curve X has. So in this, in this case, I mean, X now is a, a, of dimension one, and so there is a, uh, gromm witten hurwitz correspondence of okunikov van Panda. what it says is that if we take descendant point insertions, or it's called stationary gromm witten variance of a curve, then it's equal to uh, Hurwitz numbers uh, via the following formula. So there are these completed cycles, so it's just a formal expression of ramification profiles, and you plug it in into this, uh, you, 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 into this function x that spits out uh, the number of uh, uh, number of uh, covers with a specified ramification. So these completed cycles have a, com uh, a completely <laughs> representation theoretic meaning. And uh, well, in, in fact, this uh, wall crossing formula also recovers uh, 
this uh, gron witten risk correspondence, and the, well, it recovers it in a slightly different form, so it actually expresses these completed cycles in terms of Hodge integrals. It's probably not the best expression for these completed cycles. I mean, one of the difficult parts of, uh, of Okunkov van der Panda work was to compute uh, these com uh, completed cycles. And uh, for computational purposes, expression in terms of Hodge integrals is probably not the best one, but uh, the wall crossing gives uh, some kind of geometric framework for this, uh, for this uh, correspondence. And it also holds beyond the, uh, beyond the descendant point insertions. Okay, and uh, so the bigger picture is the following. So let me even go beyond the unramified gron witten theory. Uh, so this wall crossing is in fact is not an isolated phenomenon. So there are many wall crossings of the similar kind in very different contexts. And as I said, I mentioned already before, Chakan Fontanin, Kim were the, uh, the first ones uh, to conjecture this kind of wall crossings in the JT quasi-map theory. And the Joe proved their conjectures in full generality. In fact, I mean, their ideas are extremely <laughs> crucial for everything that I said. And in case of a, a quasi JT quasi-maps of a Quintic, for example, so Chakan, Kim and Fontanin proved that their wall crossing coincides with a, uh, with a middle transformation of A and B model partition functions. So what it says is that if you take quasi-maps and gron witten invariants of, of a Quintic and a quasi-map invariants of a Quintic, then they're related by the same transformation as a, uh, so as a gron witten invariants of a Quintic and the uh, periods of its dual. So in particular, quasi-maps over Quintic are equal to the periods of, 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 uh, of its dual on a nose. So that's what wall crossing does in, a, in the case of JT quasi-maps, and in particular in the case of a Quintic. So there is also another kind of a quasi-map theory called modular space of sheaves, quasi-maps to modular space of sheaves. And it, there is exactly the same kind of wall crossing there. And in this case, uh, the wall crossing actually relates uh, Donaldson-Thomas theory of a product threefold. So S is a complex surface. Uh, product threefold is S times C. So it, uh, this wall crossing, the same kind of wall crossing relates uh, Donaldson-Thomas theory of this product threefold with the gram witten theory of a moderate space of sheaves on S. For example, like a Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S. And such that the domain curve and then is fixed to be C. So in, in that case, it's exactly the same kind of wall crossing. So uh, semantically, uh, and sorry, symbolically, it has the same form. It just differs semantically. And so there is also another kind of a wall crossing in similar to the one uh, you know, for the quasi-maps to modular space of sheaves, and this wall crossing relates actually gron witten theory of this threefold, but now with also gron witten theory of orthofold symmetric product. So in this case, it was Donaldson-Thomas theory of, of a threefold with a gron witten theory of the Hilbert scheme of, uh, for example, of D points. In this case, it's gron witten theory of a threefold with an orthofold uh, symmetric product. And this was actually inspiration. This result was also inspiration for the uh, the uh, unramified ball crossing in, in this talk. So last, uh, last, uh, last uh, slide. So what is, uh, what is so, what un unifies this wall crossing? So essentially this wall crossings, we trade degeneracies of our space with degeneracies of our objects. So in case of a, uh, in case of a threefold, or in case of unramified gron witten theory, so we traded contracted components with uh, bubbles on the target. And in fact, this picture uh, applies to many different situations. So you can, uh, in quasi-map theory, you trade uh, the generalities of your source with the generalities of your maps. In unified gron witten theory, you trade uh, the degeneracies of, uh, of the map, like of the con of contracted components with the generalities of the target. And for example, you can also imagine that instead of, instead of, a, cur uh, instead of a map from a curve, you can, uh, you can have a shift here. So this, this kind of wall crossings also apply beyond the uh, ground width theory. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for a wonderful talk. So, is there any question? Uh, can you use the same uh, ideology for gauge theory? So instead of uh, compactifying the modular space of holomorphic bundles, let's say on the surface by sheaves, 
replace them by bundles on these bubbled up spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, can, you can do something like that. I don't know if it's useful or not. Uh, you, can, you can trade the generators of, uh, of, of a sheaf with the generators of, uh, of ambient space over which you take the sheaves. So as you say, I think you probably can, I don't know if you can actually clean up to the, to the point where you have vector bundles, but you have probably sheaves with a kind of fewer degeneracies. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, probably you can do. Probably you can actually. Yeah, probably you can do vector bundles. I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So, the degree zero maps or the the trivial class map is a special case of what you're talking about, I assume. So yeah. therefore, uh, in that context, your your object in the grown within side is the marginalized piece of Riemann surfaces with some characteristic class you have to compute. I think yeah. it's a yeah, third class of the Hodge, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, G minus first uh, cl German class of the Hodge bundle. Yeah. So your your method gives you a way of computing these integrals indirectly, correct? I think in this case it gives something tautological. It will, it gives something tautological. It will uh, the wall crossing invariants are actually this kind of a Hodge integral. So I think it will equal, it will give you something like Hodge integral is equal to Hodge integral. But how did you know what the Hodge? I mean, the answer, for example, the McMahon, which is part of this cinch and all that you're talking, yeah. it's the sign formula, knows about the answer, not the equality. Are you deriving this or using it? I'm a bit confused. We, uh, we, In other words, if we, if you didn't know, if you just knew the formula that uh, we had with, with Gawakumar, you could yeah. derive these integrals explicitly, yeah. the numbers, rational numbers. So I'm asking whether your method also gives you another way to compute these numbers. So you have to know, you have to know, um, let me go back. So you have to know how to compute this Hodge integral. That's all you have to know. Yeah. This Hodge integral is a, a Hodge integral with a one equivariant parameter. Uh, so it's a bit less, yeah, it's less complicated than the Hodge integrals that you obtain via degree zero, from the degree zero maps, but you have to know how to compute this in, uh, Hodge integral. This is the input data. So oh, you put that in. Yeah, that's input data. But oh, uh, this, is one, this one is uh, not complicated. So this is just, uh, this is not, uh, it doesn't have the same complexity as the degree uh, zero. But you can derive using that the one I'm talking about? Uh, probably even simpler techniques. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can def derive it, you can derive it, uh, I see. I'm just wondering whether, I mean, uh, from the physics side, that was surprising that we could compute these integrals uh -huh. using uh, the physics picture. I'm just wondering whether, first of all, to you, for your, in your context, that would be a surprise in some sense, and if so, are there other characteristic classes you can have closed formula? So typically, one usually gets recursion relations or these things for computing these classes. In these cases, you get a closed form for all of them. I'm just wondering whether the analogous things exist for other, other combination of characteristic classes. Um, what do you mean? Yeah, I don't fully understand. So what do you mean other characteristic classes? If you put something else? For example, the intersection of Mumford classes and so forth. Yeah. If you want to compute, you get these recursion relations. Yeah. Uh, the closed formula for the general formula is, is, is just obtained through the recursion method. It's not a closed formula for a given answer. You have to compute it using recursion. Whereas in these cases, you have closed formula for the answer. Yeah. without any recursion type thing. Are there analogous yeah, I, things you can compute here? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I mean, this, this, this Hodge integral, I was very lucky with this Hodge integral. The fact that I could compute it is a luck. I, oh, and I my, see. my academic brother told me how I to see. compute okay. this Hodge integral, okay. and he was probably the only person who actually knew how I to see. compute okay. it. It's not, a, it's not a difficult I one, see. though, but uh, so it's, more it's, it's, it's hidden somewhere in the mathematical literature, but yes, I, I, don't, know, uh, I don't know if you can, Use it as a there are numbers that are there in some sense, yes, uh, exactly. Okay, thanks. Gina yeah. zero, what? Yeah, but that is just. Mm. just I don't know. Yeah, probably can explain, uh, yeah, you can explain to me later. Okay, I have a question. <coughs> Thanks for your talk, Dennis. Uh, so um, I had a question. I mean, in the original philosophy of uh, Gopakumar and Waffa, this were, so to say, indices of, uh, yeah. of actually a cohomology series yeah, yeah. with individual numbers. So yeah. for these primitive classes, can you say something? I mean, in some cases, we can refine it in the local cases. Yeah, yeah. And for these primitive classes, can you say from your perspective something about the individual uh, positive numbers of states? 
can I say like what kind of what kind of, like can I derive the property? I mean, instead of 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 of, of I, relating to the index, can yeah. you sort of uh, can I derive like whether they're vanished for high enough genus or whether they're integer? No, no, no. I I meant uh, I meant uh, this is an index. It's so yeah. to say yeah, yeah. a combination of a positive yeah, and negative sure, sure. combination of yeah. states. Can yeah. you sort of say say something about the individual states from? Uh, no, what know. is primitive classes? I don't think so. I don't know. It's it's kind of some. It's purely purely enum enumerative thing. So it's just yeah. The other is also purely enumerative. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or, or even for the compact, if you t if you pick a product, um, orientation, would be okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> you can yeah, we can talk. I mean, I, I don't fully understand the question, unfortunately. So, uh, you, you mean you mean you can ref whether you can refine them or you can uh, whether you you can, you can refine them with equivariance probably. You can in a, in a equivariance heading if the target has some equivariance, like it's a local uh, local uh, surface, you can probably refine it with a uh, yeah. 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 I, I think I understand. So, in, you mean in the case of uh, cohomological, like molecular toda situation, you can refine the, the invariance by taking the uh, the letter, I mean this perverse perverse filtration, right? And then. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you can uh, do it here. All right, so we, we'll gonna, have the last questions. Um, so for the between quasi maps and stable maps for the quintic, you get the the wall crossing gives you like the relation between the i and j functions. Do you know what happens when you um, wall cross the the j function over to this unramified theory? I mean, you can walk across it, but I don't know what uh, what you get. I don't okay. know. What, uh, you can, I mean, yeah, J function is just some gram with invariance, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, like with descendant, uh, yeah, the insertions. Uh, there's yeah. no problem doing it. I'm just curious if it, yeah, like, I don't, I don't you know get what, something interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you get on the other side. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you.